Yo, what's going on, Nomads and Drifting Podcast listeners? I'm Brian. And I'm Monica. And welcome to the Backspace Nomads Podcast, where we talk about our nerd for movies, video games, and all the dork in between. Before we jump into the show, quick reminder, if you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you subscribe and like the video. If you're one of our podcast listeners on all the audio platforms we deliver to, feel free to give us a five-star review. That's how we grow, and everyone knows how good we are. <laughs> uh, on the podcast today, we are going to be talking about gaming marketing, uh, mobile companies ripping off indie developers, and then some tricks to level up your gaming. This is episode 66 of the podcast. It's July 15th. Let's start the show. So, Monica, we've been like starting the show off recently with like, I'm asking you a question so we can kind of like learn more about you us. You ask as, like, me nothing. I would ask you a question. <laughs> okay. All right. But, and I'm not going to ask you, Let you know, you might be right. I'm not going to ask you the question yet, or I'm going to answer it first. Because I've got some, like, rage to get out of my system today. Okay. I don't know what it is. I still woke up on the wrong side of the mattress today. Uh, my question for you this week, yes. what are you boycotting in gaming? And before you answer, <laughs> okay, I'm going to say this. I'm so fed up with EA, and I have unknowingly. Again. Again. Okay. I have unknowingly, like. <laughs> Been boycotting EA for the past five to eight years, and I haven't even realized it. Okay. I was thinking about this question. I have not played an EA game in the last five years. None of them. Really? None of the sports games, none of the adventure games, none of the indie games that they've been releasing. Stuff that I've praised them for, I stay away from it. And I feel like it's my subconscious letting me know, like keeping me safe. You know, like, Brian, stay away from them. They're bad Mm -hmm. people. Yeah. I hate them. I feel like they're the goddamn dude bros of the video game industry like they're hanging out it's happy hour they're throwing up like the surf symbol high-fiving each other (laughs) and they are a bane on this industry and i can't stand it all right Uh, laundry list first off first thing i hate them for oh they have a stranglehold on the nfl franchise there have been many really good football games made before ea like just coughed up a metric ass load of money to take control of the madden franchise for nfl that's an and actual that, um, metric, by the way, everybody. It is. Uh, Don't at me, bro. <laughs> uh, secondly, it is fine for a company to be running a for-profit business. That's what they do. They're only in it for the money. I get that. I respect that. I'm a, I'm a capitalist. I'm an all-American, you know, red, white, and blue. I bleed it. Got it. But what, what they do is they run developers into the ground trying to get there. That is not okay. Listen to these studios that have shut down under EA. And these are studios, and there's other ones, but these are ones that like I loved. That were like my developers who they would release a game, and I'm like, heck yeah, bro. I'm here for it. Okay. Westwood Studios. Classic. They almost invented the RTS genre alongside Blizzard with Command & Conquer. A legendary franchise. They are no longer in business. Why? EA hates us. <laughs> Pandemic Studio. You remember Fandangman Studio? You would load up and they had a gas mask. They had this yellow like branding. It was fantastic. They made some amazing games. Yep. Star Wars Battlefront. One of the best Star Wars games ever made. Guess what? They're not developing anymore. You know why? EA shut them down because EA hates us. (laughs) Oh, remember the Mercenaries uh, series? That kind of defined the open world genre. Oh, Pandemic can't make them anymore. Maxis Entertainment. The people who made The Sims, one of the most iconic gaming franchises ever. Yeah. EA shut them down. What? You know why? They hate us. <laughs> and they had like a couple, they had one It doesn't game. sound like you're boycotting EA. It sounds like EA's boycotting us. They, they, they are. <laughs> like, oh, unless you sell like 500 million copies of some game, we're not going to let you develop for us. And the most near and dear to my heart, Monica. Yes. Mythic Entertainment. And you might not know them, and I don't blame you. I don't. But I'm a nerd. I go way back. Okay. My first love into the MMORPG genre was Dark Ages of Camelot. Okay. These bastards over at EA. (laughs) What'd they do, Brian? They shut down Mythic Entertainment. (laughs) They bought them. They said, your product's good, but now we're going to shut you down. You know why? They hate us. Yeah. Monica, (laughs) they hate us. EA is a bane upon this industry. And I was just, I think it's because I was thinking about Dark Age of Camelot, 
Uh, they made a, a Warhammer MMO. They were a fantastic organization developer that I just, it was dear to my heart. And I was thinking about all the fun times I used to have with my brothers and my close friends. Yeah. Playing Dark. EA took it away from me because Mythic will never be able to make another game because this money hungry dude, bro, um, ass jugglers of a corporation <laughs> has decided that they're just going to uh, do what ekes out the most a tiny bit of dollars here. And I, I have unknowingly been boycotting EA for the past five years. And I, I am so happy that I finally have been able to put like a, uh, a stamp on it. Like I've been able to realize it. Yeah. I'm really happy with myself right now, Monica. I'm, I am proud of you too. Um, that's a very strong boycott that you didn't know that you were participating in. I have to say that that boycott that you are participating in, I feel like is akin to of what a lot of people, uh, the, their, their experiences with boycotts you in gaming, I feel like very, very, uh, little is actually done when people band together. Yes. Um, and similarly <laughs> to your very extensive years long boycott against EA, um, that has impacted at probably nothing. Um, I think my impact on what I would boycott is it will have it, 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 nothing will change, but something happened um, over the last couple of days. Actually, was Ooh. it was it yesterday that the the Fortnite the first Fortnite tournament happened? Oh, the summer showdown. The summer it showdown. Was. It was Saturday. It, it was Saturday. Okay, so I love watching tournaments. Yes. Um, you, I have always really enjoyed League of Legends. I was watching the um, StarCraft <laughs> tournaments. Uh, yeah. I get into them. I get really excited. I even like watching Madden tournaments. <laughs> um, I really get into them. I, I enjoy them a lot. But what sure. happens is that anytime a new game is jumping into tournament style um, gameplay, mm -hmm. it seems like there are has been an incredible amount of hiccups. And now that we have battle Royale games coming out and they want to be competitive and they want to be jumping into the esports market, mm -hmm. there have been a plethora of tournaments that are just God awful. And <laughs> on Saturday I was trying to watch what's it called? The summer showdown yes. for Fortnite a tournament that that is got massive amounts of money on it behind it massive amounts mm -hmm. it's what um i think something like $60,000 is going out to like uh depending on the day to people that get the the number one kills and then 250 goes to the yes. overall winner yeah it's uh whoever like has the most kills in that tournament within a match they get uh six and a half thousand dollars and then the overall winner of this like you know, six to eight week tournament it gets the big prize for $250,000. It's crazy amounts of money. And I've yeah. never watched something more pathetic in my life. And I've watched a lot of pathetic <laughs> tournaments. Their servers could not handle anything. No. The, the, the casters, the, um, the broadcasters are, are just uh, not on, uh, not ready to, to be broadcasting. Um, it was just slightly awkward um, they're not professional yet for these games. Sure. And oh my goodness, it was so painful to watch. <laughs> and you know what? Like I kept watching it and I was uncomfortable. I was sitting in my seat and I felt so uncomfortable. And I kept <laughs> I watching so it. so bad because like they've had big tournaments that were like land-based, right? So the servers are there. When these types of in-game situations happen, there's no, there's no problems. This is their first one that was like on the internet on like a centralized server with people like playing with it on the West coast, playing in Europe. And like, it got down to the end game where there was like 40 to 30 people within one of the final circles where normally it's going to be about five, maybe 10. <laughs> yeah. And like, it is just a different type of ball game. Oh, and, yes. oh my heart broke. But it's not uh, just Fortnite. Other games have had problems like this yes. too on their very first tournaments. And it always seems like they're riddled with hiccups and problems and it's embarrassing and the broadcasters just are awkward. And I'm yeah. I'm boycotting watching tournaments when they're new, when they're brand Ooh. new. I'm doing I'm just doing it. I I <laughs> sit there and I feel uncomfortable. I actually get a gluteus maximus workout because I'm so uncomfortable that I'm clenching up. <laughs> Like I'm not doing it anymore. I don't want to work that part of my body out. Here's what you're telling me. You want to you want to adopt 
a uh, tournament. You don't want to raise it from a nice little baby. I don't want to raise it. I want to adopt it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but Fortnite's like crazy right now. Like season five just released. That's why they had this big summer showdown. Did you see any of the, like the promotional events going around for the launch of season five? I don't follow it as closely as you because my world in Fortnite is through you Ooh, predominantly. I'm your gateway. You are my gateway. Um, I have been, I was following it because, um, you know, I live, breathe and die Fortnite now. Apparently it's all I think about. <laughs> I play the game like 10 hours a day. Uh, I can't help myself. But they had one of the most unique, very fun season five, like marketing promotions. And what the big thing that they are coining season five being was that like worlds are colliding. Um, inside of the game, you items were starting to z- disappear. There was big like, you know. Oh, I knew uh, about that. Yeah. yeah. So like like burger heads and like tomato heads, like big logos and like signs for things were starting to disappear in the game. And then, like, they actually started having them appear in the real world. And so, like, out in the middle of a, of a California desert, the Dur Burger, which is just a big hamburger, you know, think like a big Wendy sign. Like that's a mascot? The like a mascot, but yeah, yeah. So that disappeared in game, and then they put it in the California desert. And then they actually had, like, real, like, research agents that were out <laughs> there. And they live stream like people being able to come there and like ask them questions and like give them clues about what's going on. Yeah. Um, and then they actually had llama placements uh, in some of the major European cities like London. Oh, um, that's fun. France. Yeah. So like out, you know, sticking out of one of the phone booths in London, there's just a big life size llama pinata <laughs> that's like <laughs> iconic for Fortnite. It's the like funnest promotion I think I've ever seen within video games. And Lord knows they have the money to do this, but they don't need to do this stuff. This game is its own self-driving engine, but yet they're taking time out and spending money to have these really big, fun promotions. And I think it's just, it's working. Uh, It's 100% working. I don't, I can't think of many other instances where marketing has been so fun in games. Um, and, And what's interesting about it is I think about like what they're doing and someone on that team is coming up with these ideas. Yeah. I don't know who that person is, but it's one person that's like, why don't we do this? And everyone is backing them. This this must be such a fun (laughs) team to work with. It really must be such a fun team to work with. But I, I, there aren't a lot of marketing efforts that have done this well. I mean, this is out of bounds. This is completely out of bounds. I can only Mm -hmm. think of a couple instances of marketing efforts that were more unique like this. Um, Bioshock 2 had a teaser Mm. website. It was called There's Something at Sea, and it was predominantly made for more like the rabid fan base uh, Mm -hmm. that existed for for Bioshock. Um, But um, there were actual posters that were put up in cities on the East Coast. And so you would see these posters. It was almost like a concert poster. And it was for the game and it was uh, a storytelling. Like they were p- putting more and more um, uh, elements of the the story to the game on this mm-hmm. website. But they kind of, I don't know if it was necessarily the finale, but they actually put these um, bottles, these, these wine bottles that had posters in them um, that had washed up on shore. I'm using quotations <laughs> there. Because they were placed, but they placed them. Quotes. They placed them on on beaches um, throughout the world. Yeah, and then they put the location of them um, out to the fans on this really tight knit fan base mm-hmm. to go find. So similar in style and very very exciting. I I wish more games, and I think that this is going to start happening more and more. I think that. As gaming gets more more close to to um, heart and to mm-hmm. our actual activity base, I feel like there's going to be a lot more um, marketing like this. I agree with you. Uh, the I can't think of any like gaming things like you that were like that transition to our real world for like viral marketing. Mm-hmm. the The biggest one that stands out um, in terms of like dropping a trailer for marketing stuff. It, for me, it would have to be Fallout 3. 
Um, mm-hmm. People don't realize, I think that, um, or, you know, just coming into gaming now and like Fallout 4 is like, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. Fallout 2 and Fallout 3 were a decade apart. Yeah. They were a decade apart. And not only that, you know, Fallout 2 was a 2D pixel art game. The idea of Fallout 3 being a fully realized 3D world a decade after um, its uh, prequel it came out had been released is not is pretty out there. And this is how they dropped it. It was at E3. You know, they they zoom in on this like, you know, flickering light that's kind of working inside of a bus. <laughs> yeah. It shoots up and then that song like I want to set the world on fire starts to play. You start to hear gunshots and it's like this camera just is slowly pulling out on the scene. You start to see it's a bus that's been like shot and ruined and it's rusty. And then oh, the guy's voice comes in and says, war, war never changes. It was I remember, best. I remember. Oh, it was such a like out there, like no one even knew it was coming. Like it was slightly ru- rumored. I just got and, goosebumps. Like, oh, it was so good. It, like at the time when it came out, like no videos for like gaming trailers went viral. And this one was like viral. I remember like my cousin calling me who I had talked to. He's like, bro, did you step Fallout trailer? I'm like, I know, dude, because we played Fallout together before. So this mm-hmm. like this one trailer that was so it was so cinematic and done so well because they didn't reveal it with like this big action like sequence. It's just like this slow. What the hell's going on? It's kind of mysterious. Mm-hmm. It was brilliant. It was as brilliant. They give out awards to like Apple and these real companies for like their advertising campaigns. I don't know how Bethesda didn't win anything for that gameplay trailer because that's one of the best advertising to ever come out of the past 20 years. I don't care what anyone says. Yeah. Yeah. I I actually do remember it and it was it was uh phenomenal. I <laughs> outside of like games though like Angry Bird which somehow like their marketing <laughs> efforts were just incredible. I mean, who knows how the heck that happened, but there have They're been some other sounds. huge promotions. Um you know, what one one that is like a little bit nuts was um um the game just cause three mm-hmm. they actually gave away to the people that had gotten had um purchased pre-ordered sorry they had pre-ordered the game and they gave away an island on an in-game competition <laughs> an island <laughs> But what's funny about it is like, obviously, it's like I can win an island. They said that they couldn't guarantee that it was inhabitable or (laughs) that or that you would be able to get to it by any other means other than boat. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's an island. (laughs) Well, it is an island. Also, you would have to pay taxes on owning this island. Oh, you do not want to pay taxes on an island. You own an island. You have to pay taxes on it. Um, but I believe I believe whoever won was able to actually get the cash value of the island as well. Yeah. But imagine just being in a game, pre-ordering, because you had to pre-order in order to be able to participate in this thing. Yeah. And then you are in a game competing to win an island. How do we give away an island? I don't know. I've got a tagline for us, and I think it's going to work. Okay. No Nomad is an island. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I think we can get this thing going for us. Like Square Enix over there is show, showing us the way. We just have to. We just have to jump on this. Yeah. No, no matter the <laughs> island. Okay. Whatever. We'll try it. That's I mean, we have to get an island first. Maybe like 20 years from now, someone will be talking about some of the best podcast viral marketing things, and we're going to be there, Monica. Why don't you just give me a chance? Okay, I'm giving you a chance. Let's do it, <laughs> guys. Like an island. Make sure to. Give us the subscribe, follow, and uh, and give us five stars. Yeah, five stars is the only way you're getting an island. You four star motherfuckers, you are not getting an island from yeah. us. Absolutely no islands not. for you. Mm-mm. No islands. <laughs> All right, let's move on from like fantastic marketing. I could talk about it for days. There's so many like, there's so many little things in marketing. I'm a big marketing nerd because I'm a graphic design person, so I see marketing images and it's like. Uh, but let's move on to the first like big topic for the night. Uh, we were checking out this article from Engadget called Mobile Gaming Titans are Keep Ripping Off Indies. This uh, article is by Jessica Conduit, and it's about how 
mobile gaming people are taking the ideas from indie developers and because they have so much money behind them, they can produce and pump out these apps way faster than like a solo indie dev can do for himself. This is a quote from the article that I think actually like really sums up the article in whole. And it says the article is about Voodoo, a French developer. And I quote from the article in the eyes of many independent developers and their fans. Voodoo is a shady beast constantly hunting for the scraps of gaming ideas that it can quickly transform into profit. This article makes no bones. It's taking out the knees of Voodoo and these people who are just going like going after the great creatives in this industry and trying to turn them into little tiny profits. So it was really interesting to me because <clears throat> I mean, I have witnessed games that I felt like were similar to other games that I've played or clones mm -hmm. of other games that I've played throughout my entire time playing games yes. and uh, you know, years, this has been years and I've seen it happen many, many times, but what was interesting to me is I have never paid that much attention to who did it first. Right. And it seems like based off of this article and me putting a little bit more thought into it, that mobile games are even more ripe for copycats than mm -hmm. any other platform in existence. I um, agree with that. Um, and I, I think it's because like the consumer base for mobile is like split so dramatically away from the rest of the gaming community. It's where like, you know, there, there's like the gaming community on here on the right and we're PC players, we're console players, and we know who's making what, we know what's coming out. We're, re and then there's we're this reading reviews. Yes. We're seeing that people are saying, this is a knockoff of this other game. And you go check it out, um, hopefully, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then you have these cell phone users who are just like super casual people looking to download an app. So they don't have to like talk to their family at dinner. They're just looking for a dumb little <laughs> game to get away from. Uh, and lo and behold, there is a market for that. There is a market to be in this weird little mobile bubble and stealing from these super creative indie developers. Uh, so one of the things that that I thought was interesting is they called out three um three mobile developers that are notorious for stealing game concepts in this mm -hmm. article, Voodoo, Game Knots, and Catch App. And some of the elements of what they, they called out were that um, Game Knots um, knocked off an award-winning game called Ridiculous Fishing. Um, mm -hmm. They created a game called Ninja Fishing. Catch App um, has made a handful of games. I mean, all of them have made a handful of games that are like ripoffs from like Flappy Bird, which I mean, honestly, I, I can't blame you for ripping that thing off. It was a, so damn fun. I hated it, but <laughs> you hated Flappy Bird. I did, but there was a, they made a game called Skyward that looked like Monument Valley and Monument Valley is this gorgeous mobile yeah. game that had, um, that I was actually excited about. I just thought visually it was stunning. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of hard work goes into these games by these mobile developers. They spend sometimes, you know, years creating them. And then this quote really, really uh, struck me. Um, the video game industry is like any other creative field with developers taking ideas from other games and infusing them with their own perspectives, driving the medium forward and leading to ever more spectacular spectacular experiences clones take this idea of sharing an evolution to an ugly place launching someone else's idea free sometimes before the original comes to market is an uncomfortable way to conduct creative business uncomfortable but legal and what that's the quote there and what really struck me about this is that these these games are not just taking these concepts out these mm -hmm. games are taking the concepts and they're releasing them for free because they're creating in-game purchases where the indie developer needs to have a price up front because they don't have mm -hmm. the audience yet. And I just, well, I guess they don't need to, but it's more common for them to. And, mm -hmm. it, and it really just, it, it really. Uh, it's heartbreaking. It is. It is heartbreaking. You know, and I feel like I've actually participated in this in some ways. Mm -hmm. You know, I have played knockoff games and said, well, uh, this is fun. You know, yeah. I've supported that culture. And I guess like the, the question there is, where does that culture start and end? I mean, there is a direct copy, but there is such a thing as, as being 
influenced or inspired by another game and building yeah. upon it. You know, it's tough. Yeah. And like, we're definitely in an industry where um, everything, you know, every game now is kind of standing on the shoulders of the games that came before it. Uh, Sonic was made because of Mario, you know, and we have these IP laws set up. So where you, you companies can't trademark ideas within the gaming industry so that Nintendo can't trademark the idea of jumping. Uh, article like points out that, uh, you know, the people who made the first like IQ, they can't trademark the idea of first person shooters. And so these are there to protect the industry as whole. But then there's like the little indie developers who kind of get boned because of these types of laws. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, like I always wonder, you know, is it better to be first to market or is it better to be the best to market? Because yeah. first to market is going to get these early adapters, but these games are not going to live on. And is there a better marketplace for these indie developers, indie developers who take time to make better graphics, make, you know, some kind of slight story with it um, and really have passion about everything in their game besides a small mechanic? Uh, to me, and this is, I'm not a mobile player, so I could be completely wrong. But to me, as a gamer, I've always gone to the games that had better stories, better graphics, yeah. and weren't just like cheap knockoffs um, that were kind of like just a cheap thrill. The games that stand out and are legendary and that have influenced um, the entire genres for decades to come have always been the ones who come from the massively creative people. But I also don't have to pay those people's bills, you know? Yeah. I, I think the, the biggest takeaway that happened for me from from this article, because it, it felt like I similarly to when I was watching that Fortnite, uh, you know, tournament I, and I was kind of cringing. I felt cringy. This is just a cringe, <laughs> another cringy article. I was like, no, I don't like this. I don't I don't like that these people are. It feels like they're being stolen from. Um, but I, I guess what my thought process was is that this isn't something that's going to end. And I think I just need to be a more intelligent consumer when it comes right. to it. You know, I'm one of those people where if I'm going to put a, a game on my phone for traveling or whatever, I just grab whatever's easy. Yeah, grab sure. Grab whatever's there. And and there are a few, like I said, Voodoo, Game Knots, and Ketchup are mobile developers that have are known for, for taking other people's ideas. Knowing this now, I will be more cognizant and make an effort to try to find where the original, where the original concept might have come from. Yeah, and I think this is kind of like it's weird because we talk about mobile as this part of gaming, but it, it, like like I was talking before, it is is it's in its own weird bubble, right? Mm -hmm. And when Atari was first released in the early days of Nintendo and stuff, there were these cheap knockoffs that were just like quick made for profit games that no one cared about. They were just like trying to make some money real quick. Yeah. Um, this is something that has happened in video games before. This isn't our legacy. It's just that the mobile device is uh, brand new. It's you know bringing an entirely new consumer base to gaming that wasn't there before. You know, some soccer mom out in Idaho isn't here looking for the best graphics in the world. <laughs> she wants to just play something where she can swipe her finger across the screen and just distract herself a little bit while her kid's trying to do karate that she's paying too much for. <laughs> you know, it's just... <laughs> So like, I understand there, there's history here. Um, and I think it's just going to take time for the mobile development community to, um, I guess, ferment, you know, further along development for these uh, real indie developers to come along and like send it home that they're the people that you should be paying attention to. Yeah. Um, it's funny because you're right. It, this isn't, it's not, it's not just mobile that, mm -hmm. that these, uh, that this, I, this concept exists in mm -hmm. um, before we jump on to the other topic for the night. Do you have any games that you've ever played that you, that you noticed that they were copycats and were you ever offended by them or, or, um, or like upset by them? There was, a, I forget the title, but I do remember feeling like I was pay, playing like a Mega Man knockoff. It was just like the way I picked up upgrades, the way I was jumping around a, a, a platform or whatever. I'm like, this is just like Mega Man. Um, there's definitely been in my days. Oh, play RP like MMORPGs is huge on this mm -hmm. where like a J, you know, there's a Japanese MMO company that can develop a quick knockoff of, say, World of Warcraft. Um, Chinese developers are notorious for this for knocking off 
And I have played those games just because I get addicted to grinding levels. Uh, I never, never feel guilty. Um, I never feel offended by it because I know like when I played, there was a Japanese or a Chinese knockoff. I'm sorry, World of Warcraft. That I actually played for a while. And then I ended up just going back to uh, World of Warcraft because like it's just it's better crafted. It's yeah. better made. Like everything feels more natural. It feels more in place. Um, you know, someone playing. You can tell when someone's playing Mozart, you know, like Mozart's not playing it. You don't have the same emotion yeah. in there that he would have came with it. You can tell. And that comes through in gaming. So I don't feel offended by it. But and like, honestly, I don't I don't when I have a free to play game. I don't purchase these things in it. So like in that Chinese knockoff of World of Warcraft, I really wasn't buying anything in the game. And I downloaded yeah. it for free and I played it for free. Yeah. But in World of Warcraft, man, I opened my wallet up for that game. Yeah. Or I, technically speaking, at that time, I opened up my mom's wallet for that game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about you? Have you ever been uh, offended by a knockoff? No, but it's funny. Um, I did recently. So at, at work, we have, Tetris on on our arcade machine and everyone gets really really in, like like aggressive about beating one another and I <laughs> wanted to practice. I wanted to get better at Tetris, so I decided that I was going to try to play it at home and I could not find I was like, "Well, they'll have Tetris. Like I I could probably find this somewhere. It's actually really hard to find." Um, but there were tons of knockoffs and I was like, "These are just knockoffs. I cannot play a knockoff. I need to get the real game." But there were mm -hmm. a ton of knockoffs. And Tetris is such a simple game. Mm -hmm. And if you don't even put different uh, styles of blocks in it, it's like, come on, what are you doing? Is this border <laughs> I was a little bit offended. I'm like, what is this? This is ridiculous. <laughs> um, but it wasn't the, it wasn't the real deal, so I didn't go for it. But no, yeah. I mean, offended, no. But I, I think I have avoided knockoffs for sure. Sure. Uh, I'm definitely interested to see where this is going because I have not paid attention um, to this mobile knockoff. Uh, this heist that's been going on of all the creativity within the indie scene. Definitely going to be something I'm going to be checking out in the future and like keep my eye out for articles uh, from this. Uh, but I don't know. I don't I don't think it's going to have I don't think there's much these indie developers can do. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that at least as it stands right now, it's already a saturated marketplace and mm -hmm. and it's unfortunate. But the the best thing you can do is take, I guess, take uh, marketing seriously behind yep. your game once it comes out um, and see what you can do with that. Take some notes from uh, some of the, yeah. the the studio houses that we mentioned. Yeah. Today. Stop developing so slow. Turn off Rick and Morty. All right. I know you in developers. Let's go. Get to work. All right. Uh, we're going to go to break real quick. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about tricks to level up your gaming. Be right back, Nomads. Thanks for sitting through that break, Nomads. We are back and I have to open this up because this segment is due to the fact that I really need to level up my gaming. <laughs> <laughs> Monica, you know, you're, you're an average gamer. You're not like me. You don't play 10 hours a day. You I know? don't play as much anymore. I am an <laughs> average gamer for sure. And I was I was getting frustrated because some of the games that I've been playing, I've, I've hit some spots in them that... I'm having difficulty with. And I was like, man, how do I get good? You know? How do I get good? <laughs> how do I get Monica, good? How do you get good? You just get good. That's yeah. So do. so I was like, how do you get good in gaming? And I decided, well, the, what better way to get good than like find like top lists of get ways to get good off like BuzzFeed mm -hmm. articles and stuff. <laughs> Oh, you follow when I knew you know anything, I go to BuzzFeed. If you follow everything that BuzzFeed and like all of those like uh, top 10 lists tell you, you're <laughs> set for life, right? Like don't don't try to reinvent the wheel here. Like it's already been put in a top 10 list for you, okay? Yeah. So I found a handful of, of articles that were supposed to help me one up my gaming experience. Um, one of them said that I should put my own custom wallpaper on my PlayStation. <laughs> I tried that. I didn't get any better at the game, but I guess now I look. You? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what the heck? 
Put a custom wallpaper? Yeah. I don't know. Um, another one suggested that I download or I install my games in um, rest mode because it will go faster. And I was like, well, that will definitely one up my down in my install of games. But like, I don't wasn't really learning a lot about how to actually get better at gaming. And yeah. it made me start thinking about the fact that um when when like the times that I actually have gotten better in games mm-hmm. has only been because of dedication. Yes. And a, a borderline obsession. Mm. Just a my language sheer now determination to get better and even then it was a struggle (laughs) yeah it's gotta be you gotta have an unreasonable like passion for a game to get better at it like to take it really take it to the next level yeah um and i get i get asked this question all the time you're not alone monica you're not you're not there out there by yourself you're on like a cruise ship i'm not i'm not on that island no no a cruise ship of like scrubs picked you up and they're like we're gonna get get better video games come on board yeah uh i get you know i play fortnite um i stream it um so for 10 hours a day i play fortnite and i'm better than the average person i don't think i'm the best person at the game i don't even think i'm in like the top thousand you know but i i am better at the game than uh probably average consumer yeah and i was gonna ask like drunky that's my online name not brian here as you know mez know me um how do you get better at fortnite and I I kind of have a speech. I feel like a coach. I feel like I have a speech and a method, you know? Okay. Like, so you're going to help okay. me. I am. Okay. This is, here's what you got to do. Okay. You got to unsuck yourself. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking. Don't think that. <laughs> what you got to do is people who say, well, that I uh, that was just unlucky. No, nothing's unlucky. You just suck at video games. You got to stop thinking that this game owes you anything. You got to stop thinking that this is a miraculous sequence of events that will eventually lead you to the promised land of professional gaming. It won't. Okay. What you got to do is accept that you suck. And it's okay to suck, Monica. It's fine. It is fine to suck a video game. Okay. Because it's when you understand that you suck is when you start to unsuck. Okay. So what you got to do is like, why did I die in that situation? No, oh, man, well, I suck there. Well, maybe next time I won't jump on that trap. I won't jump into that spike pit, won't peek my head out. And when I do that, I'm not going to suck as bad. Yeah. Monica, that is unsucking yourself. Okay. Unsucking yourself is the only way in video games that you ever, ever achieve the full climax of your gaming potential. Oh, my God. Now get out out there. Go unsuck yourself. You know what? I actually agree with you because even the games, like even any game that I've ever played on like the hardest um, level, even RPGs, sometimes RPGs yeah. can be very, very difficult to play on the, mm-hmm. ve- on the hardest levels. And when I've done that, the only time I've been able to like beat bosses is I learn and I practice and I'm like, no, I shouldn't have done that. And I get frustrated mm-hmm. with myself, but I know the mistakes that I'm making because I'm paying attention. It, you are. When you pay attention, you start to understand the developer behind the person that you're like the, the game you're playing. Like it's everything true. you're doing has code behind it. There was a person who programmed that. Was that person hung over that day? Well, maybe he forgot to put a certain code in there that doesn't let you cancel the animation. Mm. So now you can cancel that animation. Maybe this boss, maybe they were, uh, you so know, a little high at the office that day and they got a pattern in there that every three times the boss is going to swing his huge hammer over his head. You know why a stoner's thinking patterns? Get inside the head of the developer, Monica. You're going to get better yourself. Yeah. I, even thinking about like me playing Tetris recently, Oh, it's a hundred percent. Like there is strategy behind it. And I've mm-hmm. gotten better, not because I like, I've learned strategy. I look at those stupid little shapes differently than the first 10 times I played the game. So yeah, I a hundred percent agree with you, but is it just about unsucking brain? Like, do you have any gaming mm. rituals that you Ooh. do to like get ready to, to, to like play? Like, you know, uh, you know, sometimes when you're get, trying to get in a specific mood, you have yeah. to do specific things to get there. Like, yeah, you know, no. if you're trying to make love to a lady, you don't Ooh. you don't just jump out and go, here's Brian. I mean, you could, but it's probably not going to set the right mood. Right. So like I what- like to role play. <laughs> 
Uh, I do have gaming rituals, and they're a little embarrassing, Monica, but, you know, God darn it, good content's content, huh? Uh, <laughs> so, I have, uh, you know, the, the big thing about gaming is you're using your brain, right? And the faster you can make the connection from your brain particles to your finger bones, um, that's that's the faster that's you're gonna have science. Yes, yeah. you're gonna have a better reaction time, and you know what increases your brain function? Oxygen flow. Okay. You need a, you need a lot of air going up to this big nog, and I got a huge head. Okay. You see me try to put a hat on? It's fucking impossible. <laughs> um, so here's what I do: I like to use a neti pot. I don't use it as much as I should, but I do have a neti pot. Okay. And what the neti pot does, it clears up your nostrils. Wait, no you more clean your nostrils stuff. before gaming? Every once in a while, like, oh, you know, wow. every like two or three days, I like to clean that sucker out. Okay. Like, so I have a nice passage. So every time I inhale, that's a nice, that's a nice deep oxygen flow of oh, destruction going into my forehead. I'm just going to destroy people inside a video game. Yeah. But, you know, it's good. It clears you up. You don't realize how much stuff you got up in your nose until you do a neti pot. Oh. Make sure you're using the right gross. type of water. You don't want to brain. You don't want a brain uh, bacteria getting up in there. You got to use a good kind of water. Sounds like a colonic, but for your nostril passage. It is. <laughs> um, you know, I just, colonics aren't good for gaming, but I will do them for sport. Don't put it past me. <laughs> uh, the next thing, because you're doing these nutty pots, you got, you're going to be smelling stuff they're not used to smelling. Cool. You're sitting in the, you're sitting in a gaming chair yeah. for a couple hours. You know, it's hot. I live in Florida. It just, it, it's humid. Yeah. Um, you don't realize how bad you smell until you do a neti pot. You get the neti pot going and your gaming, your gamer stench is just going to start getting up and then those nostrils. And no one wants that. It's going to distract you. You're not going to be headshot people. Mm -hmm. Get yourself some candles. I like to have like two to six candles sitting around me at all times. Oh, the little some seance. Candles. Little seance, right? Make yeah. sure they're not too close to the monitors, but make sure they're in. But make nostrils. sure they'll let the demons out. Yes. Yeah. You want them coming up into your nostrils. <laughs> Now it's we're this is an a apple cinnamon scent of destruction coming into the nostrils. All right, you're ready to go. So those that's my gaming ritual. I don't know about you got any? Um, I I would say that I do. I think that my number one gaming ritual is as minimal amount of pants as possible. <laughs> um You just made all of our male listeners. Just like double shake their head. Uh, well, it's true. No what? one's ever comfortable in a full, like, you know, set of pants. Like, you no. want to get comfy. You want something stretchy. You might not want anything at all. Um, I was actually a while back, uh, you know, I'm on the dating scene. I'm talking to a guy and, and he sends me, I was trying to explain to him, like, no, no, my, he's like, oh, what's your gaming setup look like? I'm like, it looks like a disaster. And he sent me this this drawing of a girl like sitting in her underwear playing games and just trash all around her. He's like, is this you? And I was like, yep. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I like my I like my 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 setup has to. I'm not a clean setup person. I like my stuff around me. I have a couple yeah. books over here. I got some notes over here. I got some trinkets. I got my Backspace Nomads business cards over here. You know, I've got a I've got a handful of bottle caps from the Ooh. beers that I'm drinking. Fallout. Um, You're ready. Yeah, I'm ready. And I think that that's big for me is I have to feel comfortable. If I don't feel comfortable, I'm not going to play well. And I'm sure. never going to feel comfortable sitting down. Again, it's hot, you know. It's summer. Yeah. I have air conditioning. It's not doing much right now. I'm sitting mm -hmm. next to this big gaming rig. It's just producing heat. I'm producing heat. Get stuffy in here. I don't want to be sweating out in jeans. Mm -mm. I want to be what, sweating freely. In your gaming setup, you'll never find pants or trash cans. That's not something that's going to be in there. No. <laughs> and I appreciate it. Yeah. I appreciate that yeah. out of you. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, comfort, being comfortable um, is really, really important for me. Um, and then also I'm not going to lie. Uh, one little brewski will, will do me a lot of favors. Um, I love how Northern get, you are. Huh? I love how Northern you are. Yeah. Just when one I, little brewski. One little brewski. <laughs> um, if I get one beer in me, I'm going to relax a little bit. Otherwise I'm real tense. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Here comes Kratos. <laughs> 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 All we got to do is get Kratos a few brewskis and we can settle this whole thing. Yeah. 
<laughs> Stop being so mad. Yeah, it just needs a brisky. <laughs> Uh, I definitely want to know about gaming rituals of the nomads out there. Oh uh, my gosh, yes. What are your guys' gaming rituals? Yes. What weird, do you do any weird things before or during gaming? If Especially if you're struggling, if you're trying to unsock yourself, what do you do to get better outside yeah. of just practice? Like, what are you doing? What gaming rituals are helping you get in the in that mindset? Yes, definitely drop that in the comment section below on YouTube. If you're not on YouTube, uh, hit us up on Twitter at Backspace Nomads uh, for all this weird game. I, I love to know people's weirds. I know it's kind of invasive. Maybe people hate me for it, but I'm like, what's your weird? Tell me about it. Let me know what I can make fun of you for, but I'm not going to because I'm actually interested in this type of stuff. That's what I want to know. Yep. Uh, me too. But I think that's going to do it. <laughs> Especially Monica. Tell us your weird. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's going to do it. Episode 66 of the Backspace Nomads podcast is in the bag. We will see you guys next week for episode 67. Bye, everybody. Bye.